I, I go into a lot of churches and I preach in a lot of places. Matter of fact, I'm going to New England uh, on Wednesday to Connecticut to preach to about 150 preachers uh, from that area. And, and, and I'm watching and noticing something that has become more common than I ever really want to even think about. And that is that churches are really busy. They do a lot of stuff. They have a lot of activity. But they're leaving out the main thing. They've forgotten the main thing. This morning I want to talk to you about the main thing. And that is the privilege that you and I have to worship. Now, I'm going to be more different today probably than I've ever been in 36 years here. Um, I, I, I want you just to really write down the main points of this message and then uh, maybe just the scripture passages that go with it. And uh, let, let's just look together for a few minutes about what worship can do as believers. What, what are we looking for? Now the first thing is, is this. Worship honors God's desire. Write it down somewhere. Worship honors God's desire. Do you know um, his greatest desire, God's greatest desire for us as his children is that we worship him. That's God's greatest desire for us. In John chapter 4 verse 23, but the hour is coming and now is here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father, listen to this last statement, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. You understand that God is seeking and he anticipates and God desires your worship. Somebody told me just recently, I, I don't know where he got it from, but somebody told me just recently a good definition of worship and that is that worship is giving God goosebumps. Now that may be silly to a lot of people and my theological friends would probably chide me just a little bit, but you, you get to thinking about that. Worship gives God goosebumps. In Matthew chapter 28, it's after the resurrection. And then in verse number 9, Matthew 28, 9, the Bible says, And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. You, you, you see something that is missing in this passage? At no place and at no time did, did Jesus ever stiff arm them and say to them, No, don't say that. Don't do that. At no time did he ever forbid them and say, That's not appropriate. But what Jesus did do is that he received it unto himself as being extremely timely and extremely important to him. In Psalm chapter 29 and verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory due his name. Worship in the splendor of holiness. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. That's giving God his due in worship. It is fitting. It is appropriate. It's always timely. It's the end thing in God's plan of economy for your life and for mine. In Psalm 33, the Bible says, Shout for joy in the Lord, O ye righteous. Praise befits the upright. You understand that worship acknowledges and recognizes the very nature of God himself. Now we don't talk much about worship. We don't talk much about the nature of God. We don't talk much about the definition of God and the definition of worship. You understand worship recognizes the nature of God but the problem is in our culture in our society that has become so secular what we have done is that we have commonized God and I'm not being a prophet in this place but, but and nor am I the son of a prophet but if we're not careful in this generation we're going to see that we are going and in danger greatly of losing the very awesomeness and the glory of who God is. 
I, I love the preparation and the study that we did a few years ago on the Ten Commandments. In Exodus 20, God says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And then he comes on right after that and then he says, Hey, don't make unto you any graven image. Now, why did he do that? Because God books no rivals and he wants no revival, no, uh, no uh, uh, challenges. He, he wants no rivals when it comes to this area of worship. In Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 20, the Bible says, The wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give them water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to drink to, for my chosen people, the people whom I have formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. Well, that's a powerful verse. I want to ask you a question. Why don't you really think through this a minute? Why did God create you? Why, why did God form you? Why, why do you think that you're here? I, I had the privilege this week of spending some time with a brand new believer. And, and he's going through so much difficulty in his life. I mean, his world is kind of turned upside down. And, and, and he made this statement, which gave me a great opportunity to really, really speak into his life and minister to him. Here's what he said. He said, I am interested in my happiness. But, but the problem with that statement is you won't find that anywhere in the Word of God. That God is interested in your happiness. Now, I'm, I'm going to tread real lightly here but I do think that it is a shepherd's responsibility. I think it's a pastor's responsibility when maybe there's been a theological untruth propagated in this place that, uh, you know, we kind of directed and pointed out and, and set the record straight. But we had a group came, came through recently and they sang one of the most unbiblical songs I think that I've ever heard. And, and, and the lyrics were, um, God's people are happy people, happy all the time. Well, that's not true. Are y'all happy all the time? Huh? Do you know any Christian? Do you know any believer that's just happy all the time? Well, the issue is God never created you to be happy, yet that's what the secular world in which we are living in really believe. But he created us so he could hear from our lips and from our hearts the purpose of his creation was to praise him and to glorify him and to honor him with our lives. Let me give you number two, you ready? Worship fulfills the sacrifice God wants most. Worship fulfills the sacrifice God wants most. Now, I want to give you a series of passages and just maybe write down where they're found. In Psalm chapter 50 and verse 14, the Bible says, Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. And then in verse 23, the one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me and prepares the way so I can show him the salvation of God. In Psalm 69, verse 3, I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hoofs. And then one of my favorites is in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 5 where the word says, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Listen to this. Here's the why. To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I want to make this statement. I want you to listen very carefully. God wants your praise and your worship more than he wants your work. God wants your praise and your worship more than he wants your money. Now, I can't believe I just said that, but I'm just telling you. It is who God is. He desires 
your worship. We've been studying the book of Hebrews and I'm really looking forward and, and God's beginning to deal with me and particularly about chapter number 11 and I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting back into that. But what we studied there is how that they brought the blood of bulls and goats and calves and birds and they offered it up there as a sacrifice unto God. But that sacrifice never atoned for the sins of the people. It never washed them away. Now under the new covenant, which you and I have the privilege of living in, under the new covenant, God is not looking for us to bring dead animals with us when we come to the house of God on Sunday morning. But what he is looking for us is that we bring a lively praise with us when we come. That's what God desires above everything else from us as believers. Let me give you number three. Worship rightly recognizes God's worthiness. God's worthiness. Now I've been watching a growing pattern that has developed and is developing among a narcissistic, selfish, controlling, sense of entitled generation of people that are church shopping for what they can find that that particular church can do to meet their felt needs. And then when that church fails to meet those felt needs, what do they do? They up and they leave and they go to another church that they believe can meet those felt needs. But folks, we don't come to have our felt needs met. We come to worship and to praise a living God. We come to give something to the Lord, not to get something from the Lord. I think about Isaiah when he went into the temple and he saw the Lord high and lifted up. All of a sudden, he was confronted with the worthiness of God and the sense of unworthiness about himself and it just fell into a time of praise and adoration and worship when he realized how worthy God is. First Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 25, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in his fear above all gods. And then in Psalm 48, 1, the Bible says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of God, his holy mountain. Then in Psalm 89, 6 through 8, the Bible says, For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord of God, greatly to be feared in the counsel of the holy ones, and awesome above all who are around him? O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O oh Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. In Psalm 18, 3, I'll call upon the name of the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. And then we get over in the latter part of the Bible into the book of Revelation. John the Revelator says in chapter 4 and verse 11, he says, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and are Created. We're talking this morning about the worthiness of God. I, I, I'm, I've labored about doing this today, but I'm, I'm going to do it anyway. In, in, in Luke chapter 19, I hope you'll look with me. I, I did it in the other two services. I, I, I want to do it here. I, I want you to see in Luke chapter 19, and notice with me, if you will, verse 37. Luke chapter 19 and verse 37. Read along with me. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you, if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Wow. May I just say a word? I, I, I don't want the asphalt on Highway 74 to begin to cry out. I, I, don't, I don't want the, the, the marble and the granite out in the cemetery 
to cry out for me. I don't want the stones out into the gravel parking lot to suddenly burst forth in praise and adoration because I would not. I want to be the one that offers up praise and glory and honor and power and wisdom unto the great God of heaven. I want to be the one to praise him. God is worthy to be celebrated. Now let me give you number four. Worshippers or worship responds appropriately to our salvation. Let me say it again better. Worship responds appropriately to our salvation. Here's a second question I have for you this morning. You ready? Shake your head like that. I'm ready for the question. What was God's motive for saving you? What was God's motive for saving you? You know, the typical answer that you get from most believers is that, well, he didn't want me to go to hell. He wanted me to go to heaven when I die. Well, that's a great byproduct of salvation. But it is not the primary motivation behind why God saves you. In Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 25, Isaiah 43, 25 says this. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and I will not remember your sins. Here's what God says. God, I, God says, I saved you for me. You're the motivation. You understand that when Jesus was beaten beyond recognition and they hung him on an old cruel Roman cross and his blood flowed out of his body, you, you got to come to grips of the motivation why Jesus went through all of that was in order to make us a brand new creation in Christ Jesus so that the world could see the difference in you and me and approach us and say, hey, you're not the same as you used to be. What's happened to you? And then you then could say, well, I want to tell you, I didn't have anything to do with it. God did it all. Jesus Christ became my Lord and my Savior, and he changed me dramatically. He's the difference. And so God gets the glory for your salvation. Let me give you number five. Worship highlights God's majesty. Worship highlights God's majesty. In Exodus chapter 15 and verse number 11, the Bible says, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? In Psalm 8, the Bible says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now, if he is majestic, if his name is majestic, if his presence is majestic, if his nature is majestic, then we should come to the house of God in a spirit of praise, not with the idea of what we can get out of the service, but so that we could surrender everything that we have and everything that we are to all that we know about him. We are to praise and glorify and give him honor and majesty for who he is. Understand something, ladies and gentlemen. Worship is a celebration. Say the word celebration. I'm going to tell you, I go into a lot of places where worship is not a celebration. More often than not, and this breaks my heart, I don't say this with any kind of sense of pride whatsoever, more often than not, I go into churches that are more like a wake than they are a celebration. Y'all ever been to a wake? Shake your head like that, I've been to a wake. You just go in and you sit there. And it's dull and it's drab, it's dry, it's morbid. Just the opposite of what a worship service ought to be. But unfortunately, that's not the norm. The norm is that it is dull and it is drab. 
we ought to appear before the Lord with a great sense of excitement and anticipation of meeting the Lord Jesus there. I think about old David, one of my favorite Bible characters. He was bringing the Ark of the Covenant back home. And the Ark of the Covenant um, is symbolic, really, of the presence of the Lord. And so he was bringing the Ark of the Covenant back into the holy city of where it belonged. And he was so excited about having the presence of the Lord back where the presence of the Lord needed to be that he just started dancing and he started dancing naked and just flinging his arms and dancing around and moving about and just in honor and worship of the Lord. And his wife looked out the window and she saw him. Saul's daughter, Michael, And she saw him as he was dancing up there naked. And she was infuriated. I I mean, she was bent out of shape. He comes in the house and boy, she starts on him. Well, there is the Mr. Distinguished King of Israel. Boy, haven't you really shown off today? If you read it in the context, it says, in front of your lady friends. Chiding him. Now I want to give you his response. Now this is the Whitsonian theological interpretation of the passage. He looks back at her and he says, Honey, you ain't seen nothing yet. (laughs) Dancing before the Lord. I'm I'm so bothered because somewhere between the 3rd and the 4th century uh, after the church came into existence, Satan came and robbed us of the most powerful weapon that we have from our churches when he stole away the spirit of praise and worship and carried it to the very pits of hell itself. And I declare today as your pastor and and as a man of God and as a proclaimer of the truth, I, I pray that today we will determine that the church is going to go and storm the gates of hell in great courageousness and take back that which he stole from us so that when we come to the house of God, we have unbridled, unhindered, unhinged worship and praise and adoration unto God. I'll give you number six and we'll close. Worship is a privilege because it releases God's power. It releases God's power. I have I've not made any bones about one of my favorite Old Testament passages is in 1 Chronicles chapter number 20. You've probably read it many, many times. And Jehoshaphat, uh, ordinarily when there was an enemy threat, he would just get his armies together and they would go squash it. But this time he was kind of caught off guard and unprepared. A huge enemy came toward him and, and, and he frankly was kind of shivering and shaking in his boots for a minute trying to figure out what he's going to do. And then he went before God and he said, God, you know, we really don't know what to do here, but our eyes are upon you. I thought that was pretty powerful. We don't know what to do, but we're going to stay focused in on you, the author and finisher of our faith. We're going to stay focused in on you because you can do anything that you choose to do. We're going to stay focused in on you because you've been faithful in every instance in my life. You've been faithful with this nation. So the first thing that he did, Jehoshaphat, instead of frantically putting an army together, instead of frantically... Uh, getting bows and arrows and spears and chariots and horses and armed soldiers, he called for a choir practice. He did what? He called for a choir practice. He assembled the vocals and they got out and they began to sing and to worship and to praise and to adore the living God whose eyes they were focused in on. And the Bible says, if you go, go read it and study it, at the very moment that they lifted up their voices in praise and adoration unto God is the very moment that God ambushed the enemy and routed them and Israel didn't even have to fire a shot. I, I think about Jonah. God sent a boat cab over to pick him up one day. 
swallowed him up in a fish. Here's Jonah down in the liver, in the gallbladder, in the pancreas of that fish. The acidic juices were eating away at his skin, and by now he's probably bald from that acid. <laughs> and it dawns on him, you know what? God's still God. And the Bible says that he began to sing and to worship and to praise God. <laughs> and God created nausea within that fish. And the fish vomited out the contents, not just in the water, but including Jonah on dry land at the moment that he began to praise and worship. I think about Paul and Silas. Paul didn't want to be in that jail. He didn't want to be incarcerated. He didn't want to face all that was ahead of him in that rat-infested, cold, dark dungeon of a prison cell. But he got old Silas and he said, hey, Silas, you know, it's midnight here. Now, who in the world would think about this at midnight? But at midnight, the Bible says that they began to sing and worship and praise God. And God sent an earthquake angel down there and shook that place up, opened up the doors that they could have escaped, but they refused to leave. And the jailer and his house were gloriously transformed by the power of God. You understand that I'm saying to you this morning that praise and worship moves the hand of God that controls the lever of power of deliverance into our hearts and into our lives. When we don't worship, when we don't praise, we're robbing ourselves of the very thing that God wants to do for us. You understand praise and worship releases the power of God in our lives. I've asked Matthew to come do something for us this morning. I put on hold what he had in store. and I want us to stand to our feet right now and we're going to close this time of uh, being together in worship and praise and adoration unto God with an old song that we're pulling back from a couple of decades ago, maybe more than that, probably three decades ago, maybe four. But during the time that we're celebrating today, if God has spoken to you, if God has laid something on your heart that you just really need to come and pray about and just seek the Lord, I'm telling you, altars, we had a bunch of people at altars and other two services that just felt, you know, God, I gotta get this right with you. I, 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 I've been coming for the wrong reasons. And, and maybe you need God to do something in your heart and your life and you just want to come and prostrate yourself out before him and just offer up the sacrifice of praise to him that would move that lever of power into your life. I invite you to come. Some of you are, are like the lady who joined at 8 o'clock. She's been coming for six years, wanting to join First Baptist for the last six years. And so this morning she made that decision. Maybe you're one of those people that need to become a part of the family of God here at First Baptist. I invite you to come. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you don't know what it's like to be set free from the power of sin, I really encourage you, slip out of your seat and make your way down here to the front. And let me share with you how you can know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Let me share with you how you can be set free from the bondage of sin. Let, let me share with you how Jesus Christ can become your personal Savior, I ask you to come. Matthew's got a song. Lead us right now. And as we sing together, these altars now are open for any and all. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.